Hey, uh, we have been in the last few weeks uh, diving into a series we've called House to House. And uh, there's been some incredible messages uh, around this, uh, this series, House to House. And uh, it's not just about that we're actually gathering for church house to house. It's really the heartbeat of this series is this, is that church is not just something that you and I can attend. Church is actually something that God invites us to be a part of. That the church is more than just a building that we could go to, but church is actually a family that we belong to. And I want to speak this morning on this message, a passion for community, a passion for community. And in the Bible, in the book of Isaiah, we're going to read a, a passage of Scripture, which actually is a, a pretty pivotal moment uh, in a person's name uh, who's called Isaiah. In fact, uh, there's a whole book uh, about uh, this person's life. But this particular few verses of Scripture uh, is something that is uh, quite defining, in fact, in Isaiah's life. And this is what it says in Isaiah chapter 6. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I, that's Isaiah, I saw the Lord. He's high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they called out to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe is me, Isaiah cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have now seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and he said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is now taken away and your sin is atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall we send and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. And then the Lord said, go and tell this people. Go and tell this people. This was a moment in Isaiah's life that no doubt completely reorientated his whole world and his whole sense of direction. And when this moment takes place, Isaiah is literally, he's standing beside the king of Israel and he's in the temple and he's worshipping God. And in this place, I find it amazing, in the temple, in this moment of worship, he has this vision. It is literally a vision of heaven. And Isaiah, he sees the Lord and he sees these incredible angelic beings. And Isaiah, more than just seeing something, Isaiah actually has a, a moment with God. Uh, he has what we would call an encounter with God. And in this encounter with God, Isaiah is actually, he's awakened to something that he'd never quite realized before. He was awakened at that moment to the greatness of God, to, to the holiness of God, to, to the majesty of God. And, and the response of Isaiah is this. He, he says, I am ruined. And, and what he meant by this, he goes, I've, I've had an encounter with God and, and I'm completely undone. I'm, 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 I don't know what to say. And here's what we see with Isaiah. He's changed. And in this moment where he has this encounter with God, God is actually revolutionizing his life completely. And can I say, that's exactly what an encounter with God does. You know, in this moment with Isaiah, this encounter with God, he's on earth and he's worshiping God. But when he has an encounter with God, he's lifted up towards heaven. And that's because an encounter with God will always lift us up towards God. It will always draw us near towards God. And Isaiah in this moment has this encounter with God that lifts him towards heaven. And I believe this, the reason that God brought Isaiah into this encounter was that so Isaiah could begin to see something he's never seen before and that Isaiah would no longer live from out of the place he'd once lived, that actually God wanted Isaiah not to, to walk with some kind of 
empty religious experience or to live by a, a set of rules or laws or, or, to, or to have his life just boxed in in this particular way. But in this incredible moment, he has an encounter with God and he's lifted towards heaven. And I love that in this moment, this incredible moment, it says that um, after he has this, this vision, he sees uh, something that he'd never seen before. It says that the angel of the Lord comes and touches his lips and declares in that moment, says, Isaiah, you are now clean and your sin is atoned for. And I don't know about you, but I'm so grateful uh, that our God is a God who in his love can actually atone for all of my sin and declare you and I clean and free in his sight. And you know what? God comes and does that for Isaiah at a moment where he couldn't do it himself and where he didn't deserve it. But actually in his love, he made a way for Isaiah, just as God has made a way for you and I. And from this incredible moment, after having God touch his life and having his sins completely atoned for, Isaiah has this moment where he literally overhears the Trinity having a conversation. He, he hears the Trinity talking amongst themselves, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And they're having this conversation and it goes like this. They say, whom shall we send and who shall go for us? And the response of Isaiah's heart was, here I am send me. And so what we see is this, is out of this encounter with God, the response of Isaiah is, God will now send me. I'm here. I'm ready. I'm available. And what I love is this, is out of an encounter, out of being lifted up towards heaven and then heaven filling Isaiah's heart, there comes this willingness in Isaiah now to be led by God. And you think, we ask the question, well, what does God's leading now have for Isaiah's life? Well, the answer is this. God says to Isaiah these words. He says, now go and tell these people. You see, an encounter with God, it, it lifts Isaiah towards heaven. But now once heaven fills his heart, there's this pull outwards towards people. God says, now I want you to go and tell these people. And you see, before this encounter, Isaiah, he, he was a prophet to the king. And so he had this role. He would stand beside the king and he would minister to the king. And, and, and he had this particular way in which he was living his life and he was serving this one person. But now after this encounter with God, Isaiah sees his life in a whole new light. He sees that actually God is now calling him outward towards community and towards people. And here's what I've discovered in life is if a person and in their heart is genuinely connected upward to God, then the response of being connected to God in our life is that God will fill our hearts with heaven, with His love, and there will be a pull outwards towards people. You know, that pull outwards towards people is this, after an encounter with God, is then God leads us towards us having a heart uh, to be more involved and more concerned and more passionate and more loving towards the people that he has placed in our life. You know, I was thinking about, about this idea, how an encounter with God then always leads us towards becoming more involved in the lives of others. And, and, and I, got, I, I got saved. I, I said yes to Jesus as a, a teenager in our church. And, and I, I know what it's like, what Isaiah is describing here. I, I didn't have a moment exactly like that, but I, I came to Christ. And in the first church service I was in, it, it, it was an encounter with the living God. Uh, and it was a moment where, where God completely changed my heart. And uh, I, I left that church and not just having like one encounter in that church service, but um, in the days and, and definitely in the weeks after that, uh, it was like moment after moment with God. And, and what was happening was this, is, is God was, was simply filling my heart for the first time in my life with His love, uh, with His forgiveness, with His grace, with His power, and he was doing something remarkable. And I, I remember I was a uni student at the time. And uh, most days I would jump on a bus and I would have a long bus trip uh, to, to go to uni. And uh, I would be on that bus and many times I'd, I'd, I'd want to. I'd open up my Bible and I'd, I'd read my Bible and, 
and I'd sense God speaking to me out of the Bible and, 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 I, would, and I would literally experience the presence of God uh, coming into my life. And, and, you know, as I was taking these bus trips, I, I was, remember I was, I was on the bus and we were going past uh, Chermside every day and, and my eyes, for some reason, I got drawn to this sign on a hall in Chermside and, and basically it was advertising that every Thursday, I think it was at like 11 o'clock, uh, there was a, a gathering of like senior citizens and it was inviting people to come along and be a part of that. And for some reason, I just felt like I, I needed to do something about it. And so one day I, I pressed the bell on the bus and I got off. It wasn't my stop. I ended up going inside this hall and I found the guy who, who ran this, this particular gathering. And I just said to him who I was and I said, I'd just love to come and help you do what you do. And so uh, the next week I found myself there uh, at a hall at Chermside at 11 o'clock and there was around about 30 or 40 uh, sort of beautiful senior citizens who'd gather together and uh, we'd make lunch for them. And, uh, and then after that, uh, we'd hang out and uh, we'd talk and, and sort of play board games and all kinds of things and connect with them and talk with them and just build relationship with them. And, uh, you know, for about 12 months, uh, I would do that uh, every week. And, and I love doing it. Uh, the side benefit was I became, you know, very good at a game called Checkers and I became okay at this game called chess and I learned some card games I hadn't learned before and, and got to connect and know uh, some, some really cool people, some really amazing people through that time and did that. And, uh, you know, can I say this? Uh, the reason that I did that uh, as an 18-year-old uh, wasn't out of a sense of religious duty. It, it, it wasn't out of a sense that I needed to now, because I was a Christian, do some good deeds and maybe tick some things off a box. It wasn't like that at all. Can I say that the reason that I wanted to do that was simply because the love of God was so filling my heart that, that, that God's grace and God's goodness was being poured in my life in such an abundant way and such an overflowing way in my heart that after I was having the, these moments and, and, and encountering God's love, all I wanted to do was that there was this outward pull now in my life towards people and towards being more concerned and, and more passionate and more devoted about making a difference in the lives of others. And my experience is this, that the natural outworking of you and I having an encounter with God will always be an increasing love and an increasing involvement in the lives of people around our world. You know, in the Gospels, uh, there's a, a story about the first ever followers of Christ. Uh, they're actually two young men who end up becoming, in the history of the world, the very first followers of Christ. Pretty remarkable, really. And I think in this story, which I'm going to retell to you, I think in this story, we see something quite profound in this story about what it means to be a follower of Christ and, and how God sees it, not just for these two men, but also for you and I. And the story starts like this. Is Jesus, he's on a journey one day. Uh, he's, he's heading off. He's going to a particular destination and he's walking there. Uh, and as he's walking there, he has a moment, Jesus, where he turns around and he sees that there are these two guys that are now following him. And I don't know what he thought. He's like, where do these guys come from? I don't know if they're, they're stalkers or, or what, who they are. But these two guys, just they're following Jesus along this path. And so Jesus, he, he turns around to these two guys and he asks them a, a, a pretty good question, I think. He turns around to them and he says, hey, what do you want? I think I'd ask that question if I found two people following me as well. Jesus says, well, what do you want? But if you stop and think about it for a minute, Jesus the Son of God, the, the, the Savior of the world, has turned around to these two young men and asked them, what do you want? I mean, just think about what a question that is that, that God would ask us to respond to. And I think, man, imagine, imagine the things that you could ask of God. I mean, you know, they could, they could, have, asked, they could have asked in that moment for a healing. They could have asked... I don't know, in that moment for maybe a, a, a superpower or something. Maybe they could have asked in that moment for, for one of the secrets of the universe to be unraveled and discerned by them. They could have asked for wisdom because someone greater than Solomon there was there and they could have asked God for anything. But it's interesting because the response of these disciples 
wasn't actually anything profound. It wasn't actually anything in that moment that seemed like it was too complex. You know what they actually responded to God? They said, Lord, where are you staying? Now, that's fascinating. You know, here's these two disciples, and, and I think what they're really asking is they're saying, Jesus, if you are really God, can we have a relationship with you? Can, can we stay with you? Can we spend time with you? Can, can we get to know you and you know us? Can, can, we, can we find relationship with you? And do you know what Jesus' response was? It was an emphatic yes. Because actually, these two men, some translations say it was around about 10 o'clock in the morning, but these two young men end up spending the whole day with Jesus. The whole day. And I thought to myself, how amazing is that? They probably went back to Jesus' house. I'm sure they sat down and they had lunch together. I'm sure they had dinner together that night. I'm sure that they had time there to share their stories. I'm sure they laughed a lot. I'm sure that they got to maybe ask some questions that they'd wanted to ask. And what I love about it is they got to know Jesus in a real and an authentic way in the middle of what we would call community. And what's so profound for me about the heart of God we see in this story is this, is Jesus always had time for people. In fact, I'll put it this way. Jesus always made time for people. That the Savior of the world would cross off everything else on his agenda so that he could invest time in community and relationship with these two young men. I think it's one of the most powerful things that you and I could know about our God. And do you know what happened as a result of Jesus spending a day with these two young men? Do you know what happened? Do you know the next day the Bible says that one of those disciples, whose name was Andrew, who I like to term the good-looking disciple, Andrew actually goes the next day. He, he doesn't sign up for Bible college or he doesn't go and preach a sermon or anything else. You know what he does? The response of Andrew's heart to having encountered relationship with God and, and community, you know what he does? He goes out and finds his brother, whose name is Simon, and says, Simon, I want you to come into this community. I want you to come and meet Jesus and, and spend some time with him. And then Simon's life is transformed and he's changed as well. Do you know, this is Simon, who would later become Peter, uh, one of the greatest apostolic leaders of the early church. This is the Peter who would stand up literally on the day of Pentecost under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, preach the gospel, and 3,000 people would receive Christ in a moment. And what I love about this is that here we see what happens when you and I discover Jesus in relationship, when you and I discover him in community, what automatically happens is that you and I are drawn to then have a outward focus to impact and to influence the lives of others that are around us. Because an encounter with God will pull us upwards towards God, but an encounter with God will always lead us outwards towards others so that we are more concerned, more passionate, and more devoted about making a difference in the lives of other people in our world. And I believe this, my conviction is doing life together with other believers in a community of faith is God's best plan for you and I. And I was thinking about the, the community or communities that I've experienced, you know, in church over my time. And, uh, you know, as a teenager, uh, you know, I came to church and, and then uh, began to experience community. One of the ways that uh, we would have community in the church back in those days were we'd come to a Sunday night service. And it was a 6 p.m. service. And then once the service finished, many times we'd have what's called a youth supper at the end of it. Basically, that meant that around about 40 or 50 youth and young adults would leave the service and go to someone else's house. And we would hang there basically for a, a whole lot of food, a whole lot of fun, and, uh, and a whole lot of connection and, and building friendships with people as well. And uh, I was thinking about that because it was, it was pretty cool. You'd, you'd go to someone else's house and then at the door, there'd be a little box and it would be asked for a gold coin donation. So back in that day, you could either have a $1 coin or a $2 coin, you'd slip it in the box. And I used to love it because I was a uni student 
And uh, that $1 or $2 gold coin investment, that was the cheapest and the best fee that I would have all week right there, was at one of those youth suppers. And uh, we, we, would, we would have a lot of fun and a lot of connection in there as well. And uh, I was thinking about, you know, later on when I got to own my house, uh, thinking about the idea of having, you know, 50 youth and young adults over uh, that place. And I was thinking, man, I reckon every single one of those families or every single one of those people who opened up their home for those youth suppers, I'm sure that there is a special reward in heaven for those people. Because I tell you what, the stains on the carpet, I'm sure, are still there. I try to get removed. And, but, you know, I was thinking about that, that experience of community uh, in my life. And, and you, know what? you know what? We could wrongly think there's not a lot of spiritual things that are happening at a youth supper. But actually, there was. Because I tell you, for a lot of us there, mostly teenagers and young adults, we were building relationships with other Christians. We, we, were, we were actually investing in friendships that would become some of the most life-giving, important friendships in our life. We were learning to create community around our life. We were learning that we didn't have to walk through life feeling isolated or alone, but actually God's plan was to set us in this thing called a community of faith so that we wouldn't live our lives feeling isolated, but we'd live our lives feeling surrounded. It was actually a community too that I learned was not to be inward looking, but actually it was a community where we would constantly bring new people in and seek to connect them in as well. And I was thinking about it, you know what, since then, you know, the way we do community in our church has changed. And that's probably a good thing. Because you know what, we couldn't just finish a church service and then everyone goes to someone else's place. That, that just would not work. And, and, and the way that we do community in our church, the greatest way we do community in our church is through groups. And we have all kinds of different groups now, which I think are amazing. We have, we have active groups. We've got people who, who come together and do park runs on Saturday, people who have walking groups, people who have tennis groups. We've got people who have um, host family gatherings in parks and, and in people's houses. We have men's groups. I know one of the guys that's here today, he hosts one of those groups. And basically, it's guys getting together. There's a fire pit in someone's backyard and the guys hang out. They share stories. They encourage each other and they begin to talk about what the Bible is telling us and how we could live our lives. And, and, and there's all kinds of different groups. And here's the thing. The way we do community in our church has changed and evolved over the years because it needs to. But the heart never changes because the heart of community is about connectedness. It's about making an intentional decision that God's best plan for our life is to do life in community, to do life with one another, not to try to navigate our life and our situations alone. And doing life, I believe, with other believers, other Christians in a meaningful community of faith is the greatest way that God would have us to give, uh, live. And I know that as you and I find ourselves in a place where we're surrounded by community, the natural outworking is not only do we grow in our faith, but God begins to draw us towards being more concerned, more involved, more invested in the lives of people all around us. And my conviction is that God's heart is that every single believer would live their life in community. It's what God wants from us, and it's definitely what God's desire is for us, because it's only a faith that we live out in community that can truly have the impact in the lives of other people that God purposes for us. Proverbs 18 verse 1 says this, it says, A man who isolates himself or a person who isolates themselves seeks their own desire and they rage against all wise judgment. You know, the Bible here is giving us a warning. It's saying here, you know what, we can easily isolate ourselves in life. But can I tell you, Christianity in isolation is not God's plan for our life. God wants us as his church, as his people, to be connected to one another in community and to find ourselves in a place where we have people that are surrounding our life. And you know, I was thinking about this. Do you know the thing I love the most about church? I mean, there's many things I love about the house of God. There's many things I love about the church. But I think the thing I love the most about church is just watching how God can take the mess in our lives and by His love and by His grace and most certainly by His power, that how He can bring a person into freedom, into healing and into wholeness in their life. And to watch a person, and I know because it's been me in my life, 
but to watch a person who maybe comes in to this thing called faith or into church and carrying some baggage in their life. And how many of you know we're all carrying stuff? And if you think you're not, then perhaps they need to look again because we all carry stuff, stuff from our past, stuff from our own history, stuff from things that we've walked through. We all carry this baggage. But I love God's plan for you and I is to take us and to lift us from out of whatever dysfunction that we've had in our life, from whatever hurt that we've had in our life, from whatever maybe pain we've experienced in our life, how God's plan is to lift us from out of dysfunction and how God can place us in community so that you and I are surrounded by people and you and I can find new role models. You and I can find new ways of doing life and we can be encouraged and strengthen, and where there's been dysfunction, instead we find healing and wholeness. You know, Jesus wants to use us, his church, as a community of faith. He wants to do that to change hearts and to heal souls. And he wants to do that to bring freedom into every single person's life. 